had a withered arm, webbed toes, a pockmarked face, and grew up hating. He seized control of one of the world's largest nations and murdered 40 million of its inhabitants. Even after death, he dominated the lives of his countrymen. Not until August 1991 did a determined Soviet people rise up and exorcise his malignant influence. The hands of this man were the bloodiest in history. The man himself was the monstrous and inevitable product of the Communist Party and State, founded in Russia in 1917 on the principle that the end justifies the means. Pitiless, cunning, and cynical, he mocked the value of human life, proclaiming that when one person dies, it is a tragedy, but when a million die, it is a statistic. Never has one man held such absolute power over so many and used it with such extravagant brutality as Joseph Vissarionovich Jugashvili, the monster who named himself Stalin. Down these steps to the echoing execution cellars below, they went by the thousands, men and women, the elite and the obscure, escorted to their deaths by the secret police of Stalin's Soviet Union. Above these cellars, there stands in central Moscow an historic building, the Lubyanka, which houses the organization that efficiently and relentlessly advances the cause of the Communist Party. Its original name was the Cheka. The Cheka's first chief was Felix Dzerzhinsky, a friend and colleague of Lenin's. In Dzerzhinsky's hands, the Cheka becomes the grave digger of all who oppose the party's will. The brutality of Russia's revolution and civil war sweeps away moral values. The rule of force replaces the rule of law. Justice comes out of the barrel of a gun. The Cheka is everywhere, enforcing the revolution. Prisons bulge. Trials such as this are a rarity. The civil war ends and Dzerzhinsky softens Perhaps because he is human or simply weary, he orders that the overflowing prisons be emptied of political prisoners. In future, only those who present a threat to Soviet power will be targeted. Then, as if to make further amends, Dzerzhinsky becomes head of the War Orphans Commission. The Civil War has left hundreds of thousands of children orphaned and homeless. Dzerzhinsky organizes a massive Save the Children effort. Having slain the parents, this paradoxical man will now comfort their children. They are fed and clothed, relocated, rehoused, even barbered. The young, ambitious Stalin sees the Cheka as his key to power. Control it, he must. He cultivates Dzerzhinsky. And the head of the Cheka agrees to back him. In the Moscow summer of 1926, doubt strikes Dzerzhinsky. In a personal letter, he writes, there has appeared among us a grave digger of the revolution. Dzerzhinsky senses what danger the party faces if Stalin comes to power. Fortunately for Stalin, 
Jadinsky is struck down by a seeming heart attack. One of many such fortunate coincidences for Stalin. Jadinsky's death portrait is painted. Stalin grieves for his dead friend. Also grieving are the men whom Stalin, as the party's administrator, has quietly planted in key checker positions. Jadzinski's funeral brings forth the party leaders, among them many of Stalin's rivals. Trotsky, marked for death. Kamenev and Bukharin, both with an appointment in the Lubyanka cellars. Stalin will say when. Also present is Genrik Jagoda. He will in time become Jedzinski's replacement and Stalin's personal hitman. As Stalin's influence grows, he will elbow out Jedzinski's men and install Jagoda. The Soviet economy slides into recession when Stalin tinkers with it, and Yagoda gets a new kind of assignment. Whitewash Stalin, find scapegoats, and crucify them. In the process, rid Stalin of some dissenters. The victims, all intellectuals, are brought to trial. Stalin loathes intellectuals. The case against them, as the judges well know, is fictitious. Their crime, sabotage. High treason. One of the accused takes the stand. He knows what the verdict will be. The confessions they read have been bludgeoned and gouged from them by Yagoda's interrogators. They confess appalling crimes to a rapt audience in lurid detail. The sentence is death. The trial of flawless success is a rehearsal orchestrated by Yagoda for the great show trials to come. Yagoda is lionized by the press. His organization gets a new name, the NKVD. By the 30s, Stalin foresees a power crisis. There are mutterings among the old guard. He must act. Against the imposing backdrop of the new Baltic Canal, Stalin launches his plot, a sting of such monstrous proportions as to dwarf its stage. Here, he assembles the principal players, himself, Yagoda, and Sergei Kirov, a key Politburo member. Kirov is Stalin's good friend and likeliest successor, but within weeks, Kirov is a corpse. Stalin mourns. This man, Nikolaev, has shot Kirov dead at his office door. Kirov's bodyguards were conspicuously absent. Stalin, the picture of grief, vows to avenge Kirov's murder. And with this, the great terror descends on the nation. Vast, non-existent plots against the state are fabricated by the NKVD. Thousands then hundreds of thousands are implicated with their families and friends. Now Stalin reveals the ultimate purpose of the sting. He sets up his political rivals. Two of Lenin's associates are framed as ringleaders of the Kirov murder plot, Kamenev and Zinoviev. Tortured, they confess in desperation and are dragged to the cellars. Zinoviev grovels before his executioner. On your feet, Grigori, says Kamenev. Let's die like men. And die they do. The following week, Soviet children are taught a new catechism. Stalin, their nation's father, loves and protects them. That same day, Stalin orders the secret execution of 5,000 suspects. Yagoda prepares the list, and the work begins.
Stalin removes himself from the scene of death. He takes a working holiday in the resort town of Sochi. There he contemplates his next move. Yagoda, he suspects, is losing his zeal. Yagoda must go. Returning to Moscow, Stalin is greeted by a welcoming committee. He shakes hands with everybody except Yagoda. It is the end of Yagoda's career. And his life. Yagoda is relieved and descends the cellar steps. His replacement is Stalin's adoring aide-de-camp, Nikolai Yeshov. Yeshov stands five feet tall, has the mind of a hyena, and will go down in history as the bloody dwarf. Unlike Yagoda, who could shed tears, Yeshov is pitiless. The widow of Bukharin, one of the party leaders, recalls Yagoda. From the wife of Prokofiev, who was Yagoda's deputy, I learned that Stalin had ordered Yagoda to torture Kamenev and Zinoviev. Yagoda told this to my husband and uh, burst into tears. Well, Yagoda was different from all the rest of the people's commissars. He was a party member since 1907, and of course, it wasn't because he wanted to make himself a career that he joined the party, but because he was a revolutionary, an idealist. But gradually, under the influence of fear, his character was corrupted. The new year, 1937, is ushered in with mediment and optimism. The dreaded Yagoda has himself been liquidated. His NKVD successor, Yeshov, appears a harmless, almost comic little man. Stalin begins his year with a top secret edict, one that will make 1937 a high watermark of terror. Not only does Stalin legalize torture of state enemies, he recommends it. The NKVD gets the news. Now, to work. Leonid Reichmann, former NKVD officer. When our revolutionary brothers were abroad, we knew they were subjected to torture and humiliation. But we took a liberal attitude towards the enemies of Soviet power. We interrogated them with kid gloves. When it was proposed that we resort to methods of physical persuasion against these enemies, we were all dumbfounded. Together with others, I came out and said, this is something I fail to understand. Perhaps from a political point of view, this is right, but from an operative point of view, this is wrong, because if I hit an arrested person in the face, then I'll never know whether or not he is telling me the truth. Stalin is indifferent to the truth. He knows that most of his victims are innocent, but he also understands a larger truth, that in order to inspire terror so great as to keep him the undisputed ruler of 200 million Soviets, it is necessary to execute not only the guilty, but the innocent as well. Casting Yezhov as Lord High Executioner is inspired. Stalin sees into his stunted soul. He knows that for the cruel joke played on him by nature, the bloody dwarf will take terrible revenge on the world of other humans. Yezhov turns first on the NKVD. He empties the Lubyanka of the old guard. The Jedzinski and Yagoda men, veterans of the October Revolution, whose loyalties belong to the past, who have no stomach for the new order of official sadism. Down the cellar steps they go. Yezhov replaces them with young party workers. Zealots brought up in the certain knowledge that Stalin is infallible. Yezhov looses them on the land Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Mikhailov of the KGB. 
The mass reprisals were directed against the Kulaks, against the merchants, against the clergy, against all kinds of elements that at that time were considered socially undesirable. And when the social categories had been done away with, they continued on with the nationalities. They began to arrest Germans, Poles, then Latvians, and so on. And whole ethnic populations were put through the grinder. Stalin's megalomania is equaled only by his paranoia. No one is above suspicion. Even the holiest of holies, the Red Army Officer Corps, is fed to Yezhov's meat grinder. Because their esprit and collective strength threaten Stalin, they must go. Even the Supreme Military Council will go. Stalin calls it together. A survivor of that meeting is Ivan Polishchuk. Yezhov sat at the table, and since he was a short man, he could hardly be seen. He kept squirming in his seat. His main officials kept a watch over what was going on, and he would signal to them. And then the military council commanders began to disappear. A moment before, they were sitting next to us. We talked to them, but after a little while, they disappeared. Yezhov acted triumphant, as if he had exposed and rid the Red Army of treason. And by the end of the meeting, there was hardly half of the council left. The issue is not treason. Stalin is simply taking precautions. His grand strategy is impartial. Liquidate anyone, at any level, on any pretext, who is capable of resistance. Stalin's press turns up the heat. It creates an all-pervasive environment of hate, suspicion, and vindictiveness. It is the task of every Soviet patriot to put an end to political complacency and to turn each factory into an impregnable fortress that not a single enemy can penetrate. Artist Volya Lebedinsky. If a man was at home, they would take him away. If he wasn't, they were in Kividim and so brazen they would simply arrest his neighbor instead. They had to bring in 12 persons, so they might even pick up someone on the way. But the question, why was the person arrested and what was he accused of, practically never came up. Journalist Theodore Gladkov is the son of a Soviet intelligence officer. In those years, address books disappeared from circulation in Moscow. They were on sale in stationery shops, but no one bought them. No one used pocket address books. Why? For the simple reason that when a person was arrested, the first thing that was taken from him was his address book. And all the people whose names were entered in that book were also arrested. The NKVD pounces anywhere and everywhere at the dinner table. In shops, on the dance floor, hospital patients are abducted. They're seized in the field, at a university lecture, a museum, a soccer stadium, aboard a train, on holiday. 
Even bridegrooms are snatched from weddings. Hundreds of arrest orders were brought in, and Yakubovich put a pile of them on the table along with his watch and said to us, take a look and see how many orders I can sign in a minute, how fast I am. And he would begin signing the orders without even reading them. That is how innocent people were arrested and executed by a firing squad. The NKVD are torture masters. They find, for example, that the simple concepts work best, such as locking a barefooted man in a cell with a hot floor, or just kicking him. The guards would drag you down into the cellar, and they wore studded heel army boots. There were four of them. I was in handcuffs in the center of the cell. They punched me from one to another. They were punching me and then started kicking me with all their might. I fell to the floor. When they kicked me in the stomach and they were kicking me, I fainted. The pain of the kicking was unbearable. He beat me till I was half alive. He threw me into the corner of the cell where I was being interrogated, and then he would fall asleep on the table. He knew. He knew perfectly well there was nothing I could tell him. When he woke up, he would beat me again and take me back to my cell. Imitation of execution by firing squad. That meant that during the night, they would lead you out and make it look as if you were about to be shot. They would face you against the wall and leave you standing there until God knows when. Two or three times I fainted and then my legs began to swell, after which they began to bleed. Burning matches were brought up against my face and they put out their cigarettes on my head. The Bloody Dwarf's purge of 43,000 army officers was miraculously survived by Marshal Meretzkov. Marshal Meretzkov told me that he remembered how teenage interrogators beat him up, threw him on the floor and urinated on his head and face for an army general that was simply unbearable. We've come across evidence that long before Hitler's gas vans came into being, Isai Davidovich Berg invented secret gas vans in Moscow. It was a simple airtight van in which prisoners were delivered, and when necessary, carbon monoxide exhaust fumes were piped into the van. The genocidal techniques of Stalin's secret police are several years in advance, and possibly the prototype of those used by Hitler's Gestapo and SS. Stalin, on a typical day in 1938, signs 3,200 death warrants at a stroke, then visits the cinema with comrades to see a popular comedy, Volga Volga. He's seen it already several times. In the mid-30s, Stalin shocks and fascinates the world. 
he puts his closest colleagues on trial for treason punishable by death. The world press is invited. The accused confess all, and the press laps it up, together with the audience. Confessions have been extracted by torture. The condemned are shot. Pomp and ceremony mark the 20th anniversary of Stalin's secret police. The press glorifies them. Moscow's Bolshoi Theater is readied for the gala. Mikoyan delivers the panegyric. Today, the army of the NKVD, and first of all, Comrade Yezhov, is the favorite of the Soviet people. Yezhov looks modestly down. Soon, he will be shot for treason. Yezhov's deputy praises him. There can be no parade without a float bearing a huge map of the Soviet Union. But of the thousands cheering, only Stalin and a select few are privy to the USSR's top secret map. The secret is the location of Stalin's forced labor camps, the gulags, subhuman habitats with fearful names, Amulag, Astrakhanlag, Balkhashlag, Bamlag, Belbaltlag, Vostoklag, Sev Vostoklag, Prisoners arrive at the gulags from all over the USSR, by train, on foot, and by water. Political prisoners and criminals alike. Criminals are the gulag elite. Survival often depends on chance. Kamil Artuzov recalls. Standing behind me was a man who had just been brought into the camp. At that moment, I happened to ask another man for two cigarettes, which he owed me. So I stepped out of line. Just as I did, the man standing behind me got out an axe and split the head of the man now standing in front of him. Why he did that was anyone's guess, for the victim had done nothing wrong. The man simply did not like the camp. He already had a sentence of 150 years, so he decided to commit such a crime. Another investigation would be started, another case would be opened, there was no death sentence. They would give him another 25 years, but they would move him to another camp, and perhaps it would be better there. Women, if possible, have it worse. Their ordeal is recorded in drawings by inmate Yefrosina Kesonovskaya. Night search, on your feet, strip. Kitchen garbage, fish scales and acorns are wolfed down. The living trundle out the dead for roll call. Starved corpses weigh little. You can carry two. I bet it up to a hundred a day. When the guards let you meet a man in the toilet, women get pregnant. Incredibly, babies are born. Stalin is a friend to all children. They call him their nation's father. As a small child, I was taken from my parents and placed in one of these camps. There are only a few dim things that remain in my memory, carting sand, playing with the other children, and the fierce dogs. But clearest in my memory is the horse. It was an old horse, half starved to death, but to us children it was beautiful. 
Every evening at sunset it would pass by the children's barracks and that horse was our only joy in life. The work and the exercises they gave us kept us occupied most of the day. But in the evening we ran after that horse. We paid no attention to the hands and feet sticking out from under the canvas covering the cart that the horse was pulling. These were the corpses that were taken out every day. In the gulags, few die naturally. The dead lie for days, unburied. Say, a person dies. But since everyone was hungry beyond belief, and it was already difficult to stand up, the supervisors allowed us to sit up in our bunks during roll call. They did not look at us too closely, and we didn't have to answer. And so, for three days, we would prop up a corpse in bed in order to get his food ration. Of course, we would divide the dead man's ration into 42 equal parts, honestly. The only crumbs, everyone got his share. The gulags might as well be on the moon. Escape is not possible. There is no escape possible from Kolyma. It was an act of desperation to attempt to escape from that fear, the terror being shot each minute. We were deliberately going to our own deaths, if only to taste the sweetness of freedom for a few days. Escapees are hunted down with dogs. Covering yourself up in a padded jacket like this, right up over the head and neck, you would plunge down, doubling up your knees, and then the dog would grab and shake you by the head. Here, I still have the marks of dog teeth. On both sides, I was bitten. Well, what else can I say? The dogs were terrible. Beside that, when the dog handlers would come up, they would stand there for a long time watching the dogs tear apart a prisoner. They wouldn't recall the dogs immediately. In spite of everything, desperate attempts are made, but none succeed. The second bullet brought me down. It passed through here. There is a scar, as thick as your finger. I was unconscious. I came to only when I was being dragged by my feet. But I didn't dare open my eyes, for they would have finished me off on the spot. I waited until they dragged me into the camp, and when I opened my eyes, I saw that there were morning stars in the sky. The sun was rising. We were dragged out into an open space, and they started kicking us. The dead bodies lay around for a long time, about two weeks near the guardhouse so that everyone would see and understand that it was impossible to escape from Kolyma. For Stalin, the gulags and their wretched inmates are a key economic asset. A relatively small investment in terror nets him the greatest slave army since the pharaohs. Their starvation diet costs a pittance and the supply of replacements seems inexhaustible. On the bones of this scarecrow army, Stalin builds his most prestigious projects. The first was the Belomor Baltic Canal, then the Moskva Volga and Volga Don canals, the Siberian railways, the Magnitogorsk iron and steel giant, cities in the Far East, the gold of Kolyma, the timber of the North, the great Russian river dams, most of the facilities of the atomic and defense industries. 
and the showcase facade of Moscow, the high-rise skyline of the capital. For his leadership, Stalin is saluted by a grateful nation. In the schools, children memorize a verse praising Stalin's hallowed name. Wherever we build our cities, his sacred name is with us. For the NKVD's work, medals are awarded. Here, Kalinin decorates a group of officers. Soon after, many will descend into the cellars. Because of what they know, their mouths will be silenced, but not with a kiss. Even the bloody dwarf must go and is blamed for all atrocities. His executioners report that Yezhov scurries around his cell, squeaking like a mouse and dodging bullets. Yezhov's liquidation is applauded as a possible end to the terror. His replacement by Leventi Beria is greeted with hope. Unlike his predecessors, Beria is a dynamic personality, able to influence even Stalin. He brings a new concept to the work, a systematic planning of the slave labor supply geared directly to Stalin's two most strategic needs. filling the huge new labor quotas and the mass incarceration of peoples, both foreign and domestic, who impede Stalin's progress. Of Beria's many crimes on Stalin's behalf, one is to remove the likeliest source of future Polish resistance, the Polish officer corps. Beria accomplishes this with the murder of 14,000 elite young Poles in the Katyn forest. Stalin blames this massacre on the Nazis. Beria now undertakes the genocide of entire populations. NKVD soldiers came to our home and warned us that we had 30 minutes to collect our belongings and be ready to leave. No one knew where we were being taken. We grabbed just what was at hand. The people of one village resist and are herded into a huge barn, 700 of them. The floor was covered with straw, and then straw was spread around outside the wooden bar. It was shut tight. Kerosene was poured around it, and it was set on fire. Can you imagine? Everyone in there, even babies who were born that night, were burned alive. The human cattle cars roll for the gulags. The box cars were not equipped for carrying people or for their physical needs. So, for example, we just made a hole in the floor of the box car and responded to the call of nature. But some of the women were too shy. They couldn't do it, and many of them died in agony from a ruptured bladder. As we were being taken by rail to Siberia, we buried our dead in the snow. Of our family, only I managed to survive. They did not all die in transit, but when we reached our final destination, that's where they died. We couldn't even read the last prayer in Arabic for our father or mother. Whoever lagged behind a bit was shot. As a diversion, Beria practices rape. Girls plucked from the streets of Moscow are delivered to the NKVD chief. 
years later at the scene of her rape in Beria's office, one of them remembers. He bent over and said, my, how your cheeks burn. And he walked over there and pulled the curtain back, displaying a huge sofa covered with green silk. Then he came up to me and said, as one might to a dog, perhaps uh, we should uh, lie down now, eh? Then I felt something heavy pounce on me, with leather squeaking and buckles scratching and a kind of groping started. With one hand he clutched my throat, strangling me, and with the other he pushed me to the floor. He kept banging my head against the floor, ripping me all apart, ripping me. You may be sure that in the future as well, I shall spare no effort to serve the socialist homeland to carry out the assignments of Comrade Stalin. The Great Terror has created hundreds of execution sites in the Soviet Union. In Moscow, there were several zones or territories surrounded by high fences where people who had been condemned by tribunals or special sessions were brought and where the acts of execution were carried out. These burial places were called strawberry patches. And indeed, in due time after the burials, strawberry bushes were planted there. I can imagine the blood red berries that were picked in these patches. Next to one of the strawberry patches was the Sukhanova prison the most fear-inspiring of the Stalinist regime. It was Beria's personal preserve. In it were torture chambers with instruments designed to inflict maximum pain. Some were used to slowly break the bones and crush the joints of victims. Here as well, the use of electric shock was pioneered. Only high-ranking prisoners were brought to this prison. On arrival, they would be stripped naked and summoned to Beria's office for an official welcome to the Sukhanova. The mind of Beria, like that of Stalin's, is incomprehensible. One can only imagine that he sees in his death-dealing work a kind of ghastly beauty. Three months after Stalin's death, Beria is shot as a British spy. As the executioner takes aim, Beria kneels and pleads for his life. For 30 years, Stalin ruled invincibly. Stalin's bludgeon was his secret police. On his orders, they kept a nation of 200 million paralyzed with fear for a generation. And Stalin, in the tradition of all tyrants, since Nero, tried to mask the terror with great public entertainments. Stalin became history's most powerful human, and remains so to this day. Perhaps reviewing his parade, he glimpses for an instant that other parade the ghostly divisions who trooped in endless columns through his gulags and prisons. Of the 40 million marchers in that parade, 20 million perished at the hands of Stalin's secret police. With their bodies, his people spell out their respect, in the skies as well. Long live Stalin. Joseph Stalin, the father of his nation, died a natural death at the age of 73.